Hi, it's Diane, and I'm very excited for my new book, Daily Meditations for Visionary Leaders. Check it out on my website, visionsapplied.com forward slash meditation. Now, on with the show. If you are listening to this podcast, it means you are searching. Searching for someone who understands you, someone who gets you. You are yearning to be understood and to belong. Welcome to the Someone Gets Me podcast, where we help smart, talented, and sensitive people navigate an often insensitive world. Let's welcome your host, ambassador, author, speaker, and mentor, Diane Allen. Diane has the experience and knowledge to educate and inspire as she has been there and understands your unique intensities and their challenges. Hi, everybody. It's Diane again with the Someone Gets Me podcast. And I have an exciting interview for you today. The guest we have on the show today is an amazing, inspired man. He's a marketing advisor to individual entrepreneurs who want to create and grow their business from their heart with high integrity and authenticity. This man has already authored two books. I've read both of them. The first one is Authentic Content Marketing. To how to build your engaged audience for your personal brand through integrity and generosity. And the second book, I believe it was just released last week, which is amazing. I, I read it the day I heard about it out, is Joyful Productivity, a Solopreneur's Guide to Creativity and Well-Being. So I'd like to welcome to the show today, George Cow. Thank you, Diane. I've been looking forward to this and um, I'm just glad to be here. Oh, I'm so happy that you're here. It's so exciting. In case the listeners don't necessarily know, you are in my book, Daily Meditations for Visionary Leaders, and I asked you to be in the book because I know your work and I see you as a visionary leader. I want to start kind of there, the fact that you're a visionary and you are a, a torchbearer, if you will, in your industry where you actually teach a lot about authenticity and integrity and leading from the heart instead of leading from like greed and fear and those kinds of things. Can you tell me a little bit and tell the audience a little bit about how or when you kind of figured out that you were a visionary or a little different than, than the person who was just following down that, you know, same old, same old road? Mm, thanks for asking. So, you know, I, I, it's funny. I'm not sure I've ever called myself a visionary. <laughs> and I think that it is a great honor for you to call me. A visionary because I, I see you as a visionary I see you as a leader of visionaries and I think that's really it's how I think that's how it best happens is when when you when you when you keep on uncovering your authentic self and integrating your authentic self into your work and you keep expanding your authenticity in the world people start calling you a visionary <laughs> and inviting you on their podcasts you know <laughs> So I, I feel that um, it really, I'll just give you a quick history um, to give everyone context here. I used to, uh, when I started in 2009 with my business, I was following the conventional marketing strategies of um, using scarcity tactics and uh, doing webinars that were supposedly free trainings, but they were cleverly designed sales pitches that got sold people into high-priced programs. Maybe some of you listening have encountered um, marketing that purports to be beneficent and, oh, give you free things, free articles, free reports, free webinars, but they try to get you to sign up without telling you that's what they were going to do. And, I, I, you know, to be honest, the reason why I was successful financially doing that, this is why I, a lot of marketers keep doing it because it works in the short term, I should say, because in the longer term, people see what you're up to, you know, and you don't really build a, a, a loyal long-term following by using tactics that might manipulate someone into a decision in the short term, but then they will see that that's, you know, your intentions were, were not in true service to them from the, from the beginning or, or not aligned rather to what your words are saying, you know? And so 
I really had a couple of years of, of, of that where I, I thought that was the right thing to do because that's what everyone else was doing. And then my conscience uh, started to sabotage my efforts. And that, that was interesting to me because it was making money, but then my conscience wasn't aligned 100% with my actions. You know, wasn't even aligned 50% with my actions, maybe. But the more my conscience woke up to what I was doing in my business, the more my subconscious mind created resistance and blocks. And, you know, the way I was appearing to others uh, energetically, you might say, uh, was not effective anymore. At that point, when my you know, at that point, the financial results also started declining. And with that de financial decline, I, my conscious mind had to really take a look to say, what's going on here? I need to do something different. I need to change what I'm doing because it's not working as well financially anymore. And my heart hasn't been in it for a while now, you know, and I'm so glad that my conscience really kind of led me to a place of, no, George, you, you need to, you need to really believe in the things you're saying in terms of serving the world. And you, because you actually deeply believe, you know, I, I, I deeply believed even since the beginning, I, I really had a heart for service. It's just that my actions weren't matching that deep intention. And so, uh, you know, a couple years in, you know, around 20, 2012, 2013, I decided to make a dramatic shift uh, of, of how I was doing business uh, to align much better with my conscience, my values, my heart. And ever since then, it has been far more joyful to do my business. It has been deeply fulfilling. My relationships with my clients and with my audience has been much more true and authentic than it used to be. And I'm happier and I'm healthier as well, which is really, really important. So I think if, I think as we come to, to align our actions with our, well, first of all, as we come to discover what our deepest values are, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is one of the things that you work with, with, with clients on. And then as we come to align our actions with our deepest values, I think we become visionaries. Yes, absolutely. And the getting in touch and being aware and honest with ourselves about those deeper values, the ones that are underneath, like really, when I'm talking to my clients, I go, okay, what do you value? And then they answer and I go, okay, now like really underneath that, mm. what's, what's the deep core that is the fuel for the vision, the fuel for the daily action, the fuel that keeps us going when you know, our outside world may be all chaotic or something and like what's going to, you know, help us really stay on the trajectory. And that's the things that are underneath really, which is that authenticity, I think. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I love that you use that, that idea of that's the fuel mm -hmm. because it's true. It's when, you know, we, we've heard this forever, the idea of follow your bliss, right? Mm -hmm. Or to... Um, to, 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 you know, to do your passion, to work your passion. Um, I, you know, what we're talking about is really that. Uh, sometimes people think follow your bliss, they just mean, you know, they, they don't really understand what that means or follow your passion. What does it really mean? It means, like you've said, coming to a true and deep and embodied experience of, 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 your, of your values, of what your mission in life is, what you um, stand for, what your calling is, and then letting that, I mean, that will spur you on. That spurs me on every single day. Yes, it does. It's, I, for me, that's why I get up in the morning, you know, is to be connected in that, that place. And if there was a different opportunity, I wouldn't take it no matter what. Yeah. It's just the way it is. I have a question that has to do with entrepreneurs um, and the way they operate. And I know that you're an expert in that because you, you, you are one and you, you work with entrepreneurs. So I thought I'd ask you this question. Um, and that is that I, I was listening to a, another podcast actually recently and there was a gentleman there who said that most entrepreneurs 
are really gifted and smart and out of the box thinkers, which, you know, yes, that's true. But he also said that a lot of entrepreneurs have things that look like ADD or ADHD, where they just go from thing to thing to thing and think in a different way than a regular person. And so when he was talking, I agreed with everything he said, because that's like how I am and the other entrepreneurs I know. And then he went on to say that the difficulty and the reason why entrepreneurs are difficult to deal with, which I don't agree with that part, but okay, is because they have a difficulty remaining focused. And I, it's, I just heard this a few days ago and I thought, huh, I'm going to ask George about that because how do you, first of all, how do you stay focused? And do you have that experience with the different entrepreneurs you work with of a difficulty remaining focused? Now it's a, it's a, it's a great question. The way I stay focused is I work on things that I, that I believe in deeply. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs, they go from thing to thing because somebody else said that this is the end all be all strategy that they should follow, or they read an article or they watched a video or they took a course that said the, the five step framework you must you know, follow for your SEO or, or, or for your product development or whatever it may be. And if it doesn't resonate deeply to say, yes, that is so true, that that's something I really want to, to, to give a real go at, you know, I, or, or it's something I want to become excellent at because I really believe in, in, in that model, then it's easy then to go from thing to thing, you know, or, or another reason why they go from thing to thing is because they're, they're trying to do something that maybe they themselves shouldn't be doing, that they should be delegating or, or, you know what I mean? They should be hiring it out to someone else to do the, the, some aspect of the marketing or, or some technology, technology, uh, technology thing in their business rather than, than they having to learn and become masters at it. So the, the, what I, the way that I remain focused, so I'll, I'll give you one example of where people see that I'm focused um, is in my, in my content you know, my, in, in the sort of the consistency of my content. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have been doing this for the last just about three years now. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have a new video and a new blog post. Essentially six pieces of new content per week. So in, essentially in the past, you know, every year I, I make 150 new videos and I write 150 blog posts. And I have a full client load and I run a coaching program and I teach, you know, online courses. Um, and I work no more than 40 hours a week, you know, at home uh, with plenty of breaks. Right. So the reason why I am so focused with my content is because I believe in it so deeply. I believe that when we do content, when we write articles or uh, write books or make videos or record podcasts, from a place of service to our ideal audience, when we see it as a ministry, which for those of you who are not religious, we'll just say ministry is one's volunteering in the world or one's work in terms of positive impact in the world, you know, one's calling in the world. When, we see, when I see my content as, as a ministry and, and as my calling, and so one, it, it deeply serves the people who consume my content. Uh, and, and two, and by the way, even before lots of people said they were served by it, I kept doing it. And that's, that's a really important key because some entrepreneurs, they base success only on the external metrics. Oh, George, I blogged, I, I wrote 10 blog posts and nobody commented, nobody said anything. So it must be a failure and I should stop doing it. Well, if you believe your content is a ministry and that even if there are, there's one person who read it, even if they didn't comment, it may have changed their life. Okay. Now that's, chances are more than one person read it. Even if you have a new website, you know, just, just Google will, will pick it up. Or if you start sharing it on LinkedIn and Facebook, what your blog posts are, and Twitter, et cetera, someone's going to read it, you know, especially on Twitter, you use hashtags on Facebook, you, you know, you, you, you put on your business, you put on your profile, put on your business page and, 
and you know boost it to to people of certain interests for even five dollars or something like that you're going to touch a lot of people and they might not comment but they are still being influenced by you so when we think about that when we realize our content is a ministry and in ministry and in, in, in serving somebody else we don't go I'm only serving you so that you can tell me how, how, how wonderful this service is. That's not, that's not true service. I'm serving you because it's worth doing, because you are worth serving, and this service is worthwhile to provide. And also, I'm serving you because it also makes me a better person. It helps me become more excellent at this service. It also fil fulfills my heart, because I, I think this is a worthwhile action. It grows me as a person. And so when I, you know, in the beginning couple of months, when I didn't get a lot of fans and, you know, commenting on my, on my blog posts or videos, I, I kept returning every day to that place of, that's right, this is a ministry. And this is also for me to grow my own knowledge and my own spirit uh, and my own uh, discipline even, you know, that's how I stay focused. And once I, I kept returning back to that. It's kind of like in meditation, right? In, my, in meditation, mm -hmm. we don't say, oh, my mind wandered. There must be a failure. I, might, I should stop meditating. No, no. We, we say, oh, my mind wandered. That's interesting. Let me bring it back to oh, the, whatever the object of meditation is, my, my breath or my mantra or the object I'm, I'm looking at or whatever it may be, the object I'm thinking of. Let me keep bringing that back to the practice. And that's what when we find an entrepreneurial activity that we believe in that we want to become great at because we believe the activity itself is worthwhile then we just keep coming back to our intention as a meditation as a practice and when we do that we form a habit so diane you say george you're focused mm -hmm. i don't really think i'm focused i just i just happen to have a habit of doing it and so i look focused <laughs> <laughs> well it makes perfect sense and you mentioned something right in the beginning that I think kind of differentiates what that gentleman was saying and, and kind of what I think. And that is that when you're interested in something and it's truly coming from the inside out, we can stay focused on it forever. And mm. that's, not, that's not ADD. That's an intellectual gift. It's intellectual overexcitability that highly intelligent, creative people have that an average person doesn't necessarily have and people have it in different parts and it's part of the brain development of gifted people is that ability to laser like focus on it if it's what serves and it's what's the right thing and it attunes to them if it's something that's not of interest to them they're going to be all over the place because it doesn't grab them and those are the people that can look like they have ADD and laugh about it, but they don't. They're just, it's kind of, I always imagine like a heat seeking missile or a radar or something looking for that thing mm. that, that I want to dive deeply into. And then I want to go there and be there and explore there and have that grow, whatever that would is. And like when you were talking about believing in it deeply, I think that's the differentiation that was not mentioned by that other person. I don't, I don't know what his, yeah. you know, what his whole belief is. But right. when you said that, I'm like, oh, you know, that makes sense to me because yeah. a, a lot of people don't understand that intellectual overexcitability mm -hmm. and the emotional overexcitability that it makes a lot of people very sensitive and care very deeply and That's feel right. things very intensely about what it is they're doing. And so those two things together can create an amazing amount of focus, even in the face of all kinds of distractions. The, the other thing about entrepreneurship, especially, is that it is not the same path for everybody. There is no five-part formula, 12-part formula that everybody follows to become a successful entrepreneur. The, you know, if that's the case, you just go get a job and someone tells you exactly what you need to do. Entrepreneurship is about creativity, and creativity is about exploration what might look like ADD, like you said, is like a radar. Like they're, they're, they're trying different things until they find something like, like, as you said, that they are deeply interested in. And the trying part of it looks like ADD, but you do need to try a lot of different things to say, ah, this really fits me. This really gets me excited. Yeah. This really has passion for me, you know? Right. And that's that curiosity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think, people who are entrepreneurs and people who have that entrepreneurial type spirit, whether that's how they're actually employed or not, 
are curious by nature and right. and that can get misunderstood by somebody who maybe doesn't have that level of curiosity as as something that's not quite right when really it's something that's a very valuable gift very very well said curiosity that that's it it's so important in any creative endeavor and and you're right those who have jobs if you're lucky enough to be able to kind of be an entrepreneur in your job, if you, if you have that leeway given by your supervisor or boss to say, yeah, you can try different things and, and uh, do, it, do it your own way, that, that's wonderful. Right, and employ that curiosity. I think, I think that's the key, actually. Yes. So what about procrastination? Like, you know, procrastination, I think, sometimes comes from when people are afraid on some level of not being able to perform or maybe they're, I call them a time optimist where they, well, I could do this in five minutes when really it takes, you know, three days and, and they're just completely wrong on, on the timing. I, I, I do that. I still do it, but I don't do it nearly as much as I used to. And so what about procrastination? What, what are your thoughts on that? And, and maybe you could share a couple tips you might have or some suggestions for somebody who might have that as one of their challenges in the world. Wow, yeah, procrastination has actually a, a, a variety of reasons why. So there is no one solution for procrastination. I think it, it requires, you know, having either a kind of a observant friend help you to see the different reasons, the different ways you procrastinate on different things, or, or ha working with a coach like yourself is very helpful. For me, I'll say, uh, a lot of times I procrastinate because I'm thinking of the overall project and it is if the project feels so important to me that I may slip into the false thinking that I've got to do it right the first time or, or it's got to be perfect. Uh, I, I really can't fail at this. I'm going to look bad if I fail at this. Um, and if I work up in essentially, I, I work up this image of perfection of that project in my mind, it intimidates me. And when, when we get scared and anxious, of course, our, our minds and, are, are, are so brilliant. I, I, I like to say the smarter you are, the more convincing are your excuses. Oh, yes. You know? and, and, and I think that's a lot of people who are yes. listening to this. Is, is sure. you, you guys are all really smart. And so sometimes your excuses for yourself <laughs> or why you shouldn't do it are so convincing. You know, you convince yourself that, oh, of course, yeah, I shouldn't do this right now, you know, or I should put this off. Uh, but when in reality, it's, it's because we're scared and because we have worked up this idea of this false illusion that it's supposed to be perfect. What is perfect anyway? No project is ever perfect. If you really think about it, everything can always be improved. And the truth is, I've discovered anyway in my own business and, and life, that if I don't get started and, and produce something, I can't get better at it. Just planning and designing and trying to make it perfect, I don't really grow. I don't really learn. The learning comes in the doing and the, I'm sorry to say, the making mistakes along the way and correcting uh, those mistakes if they come up. Now, so what I do to resolve this intimidation that I have about a big project is I, I this is important, for, I have to write down what the simple next steps are. And it's almost miraculous for me when I do that. Instead of, for example, um, I was just working on it today. You know, I'm, I'm working on my next online course and I have this, this big project, this topic that is so important that it scares me uh, to not teach it perfectly. So then I wrote down, okay, I, I found myself kind of twiddling my thumbs and kind of being a little bit anxious about it. And I caught myself. Now, nowadays, I'm gra grateful that I can observe that more quickly now. Instead of spending three days at it, now I can spend, you know, 15 minutes going, wait, I'm, I'm procrastinating here. So I quickly opened a, a well, I, I use a document online, but you could take out a piece of paper if you want or use your phone to, uh, well, danger there. <laughs> you turn on your phone, you end up procrastinating doing other things. But uh, uh, just get a piece of paper and just write down what are the steps that I know are involved in this project. It doesn't have to be in order right now. Let me just write them down. And let me write down as many of the small steps as I can, the steps that feel really doable. So for example, for me, I wrote down, find three similar courses on this topic, you know, as one step. The next step is find, you know, uh, three topics from each of the competitive courses that I may also want to cover in this course, right? And the next step is uh, integrate 
my notes from this document. You know, so I had to literally write them down so I go, I can relax and go, ha, ah, okay, yes, I can do that. Oh yes, I can, I can, I can research uh, for 15 minutes. And also sometimes it helps me to write down just for 15 minutes because whatever task I'm doing, if it's for an important project, it can go forever. You know, researching courses, researching, you know, my integrating my notes, that could take three hours or three days or 30 minutes. So if I wrote down, just take 30 minutes to research three other courses, then I go, okay, 30 minutes is, is whatever I can do in that time is, is fine because the reality is there are unlimited things I can research, right? But if I, if I create what I call a temporary constraint, a temporary constraint, do this for 30 minutes, write down only three things that I must cover in this project or whatever, then it helps me to relax and it helps me to really get moving on it. Well, those are great t tips because one of the things I do sometimes is give like a short time frame, like, okay, do this for five minutes. And sometimes yeah. I can do whatever it, it is that I'm stalling about um, longer once I get started, once I open the computer. And, you know, some days I spend all morning teaching and then many clients in the afternoon and I get home and I'm like, okay, it's time to do some of my online work. And my head is not into being on my computer. It's into mm -hmm. anything else other than that. And so sometimes I say, oh, just get started. Just do this one thing, you know, mm -hmm. and answer this one person's email. Or I, sometimes I'll check email on my phone mm -hmm. to see if anyone needs me. And if they don't, good. I, I, and then I don't open the computer. So now I'm like, no, you answer it on your computer. And so that you can zero it out, but also so that you can at least get started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's those little short manageable little chunks that I think really help. And so I love those tips. Those are awesome. Yeah. I, I what you said about the five minutes really, really makes a difference. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we are willing to just show up and start the work, you know, oftentimes our, our, our brains then, then kind of get going or, or maybe if you believe in a creative muse, you know, or a mm -hmm. spirit starts to work through you or something. It, one thing that f I find helpful is setting a timer you know um and so you know find a timer that's easy for you to quickly pull up it has to be quick and easy like you know if you have a smartphone then there's a timer on there you can quickly use or if you're using a browser you can set a timer i, I use it on chrome there's a free plugin called one click timer one dash click separate word timer you find it on google chrome store um plus i guess google chrome extension store it's free you can install it and and it's like right there in your browser, you can easily use it. So yes, tools like that can, can make a big difference. Another tool that I wanna to recommend to people is, which I use many times a week, is called Focusmate. And it's focusmate.com, focusmate.com. And it, is, uh, it pairs you up with somebody else around the world who wants to focus on a particular project for an hour or 50 minutes. And during you know you look you go you log in currently it's free it's going to be paid sometime down the road but while it's free go ahead and try it out and use it it's awesome i love it it really makes a difference for me you go there you sign in there's a calendar you find a spot that works for you and then you match you get matched up with somebody else and then at the time comes you log in you know you 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 have your video they have their video but you're just working on your computer you're not really looking at each other you just have the video on the side just so that uh you know, you can kind of stay accountable to working. You, you mentioned to each other very briefly in the beginning what you're working on. They do as well. And you can check in with each other occasionally throughout the hour via chat to say, yes, I've done this. I've done that. So that works a lot. That works really well for me also. Oh, I love that because sometimes all I want is some company. Yeah. <laughs> like they don't even have to know what I'm doing or no. talk to me or whatever. Yeah. Just like have a, a human around somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and A focused um, human. <laughs> right. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Focus you got it. You got it. Com. You have to give it a try. I'm there uh, most weekdays. You might even be able to catch me. I usually put in my times for the following week. I usually do that uh, Friday afternoon Pacific time. So let's say by Saturday morning, uh, anywhere around the world, you go, you probably see my, my, my times for the following week and feel free to book with me and then we'll work together. Oh, that'd be awesome. I'm going to try that out because yeah. sometimes that's all my brain wants is like a focused or another, just a human yes. around, you know, that, yes. that I'm not solving the problem. I'm not the one in charge of that whole thing. I'm just 
be in me doing my thing. And oh, I love that idea. Oh my gosh, yeah. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, what do you do for fun? What do you like oh. to do? Wow. Um, so I, I was, I was, I was going to say business <laughs> because, I, because I actually really do have fun with, with, with my business and with my clients. And it's really, you know, I think that's one of the joys of, 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 you know, finding your authentic work, you know, like once you, once you find your authentic work, it is, um, it's a lot of fun. So, so instead of answering that question, I'll answer the question, what do I do when I'm not working on my business? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because I have fun in my business. Well, that's what I would do. Um, I have uh, two cats and a dog. So they, they definitely occupy, especially, you know, my dog. I, I go on, you know, dog, long dog walks on the weekend or uh, when I'm not working. So that's, that's good. Keeps me active. You know, uh, let's see, what else? I mean, you know, my wife and I watch some shows on, on, on the internet. My life is actually kind of boring, to be honest with you. <laughs> and of course, occasionally, I have wonderful people like you come and visit and, you know, you and I are having, having dinner really soon and in person and uh, that's fun too. So, so I don't have a lot of hobbies. I mean, uh, you know, I have a guitar that I pick up every now and then. Yeah. So that's pretty much, and occasionally we might take a trip here or there, but yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, that, that's what I would say that I do for fun is my work. I love my work. I, yeah. I also have my sailing and quilting and other things, but yeah. when I'm in the zone and I'm doing my thing, my work, it's not work. Yeah, exactly. uh, it's it actually brings me joy and energy and fun. Yeah, and that, this is another question that's a little bit on the personal side, but I think it would be okay. I'm curious about what kinds of books you enjoy reading, like the genres, like what kinds of things intrigue you that you enjoy reading about, whether it's an audio book or or a physical book or whatever. Because you're an author, and we're going to talk about the books here next, yeah. your books next. But what kind of books do you enjoy reading that feed your soul? You know? Yeah. Well, most of the books I read are, are about business and marketing mm -hmm. uh, because I do feel like I need to continually learn for the sake of my clients and um, just you know, become better in my field. So that's, that's that, that aside. Besides that, I really uh, get fed by reading, I guess, spiritual books, but particularly I'm really into reading about near-death experiences. I know that sound, they may sound a little strange for people who haven't read that kind of literature, but it's, it's, uh, I, I find it very f fascinating that, you know, there are people who, you know, they, they have some accident and they're revived. They, they, they are at, at the point of death and then maybe it's a heart attack or they're, they, they almost drowned or struck by lightning or, or whatever it may be. And then they're revived uh, by, by the hospital and um, some of them talk about, my gosh, I, was, I saw my loved ones who had passed on and I um, saw heaven or I saw hell, you know, in some cases, or um, I got knowledge that I couldn't have gotten otherwise. And I find that those literature so encouraging. Um, you know, there's a book called Love the One You're With, which is a beautiful compilation of some of the best near-death experience stories love the one you're with. If you don't, you know, want to pick up the book, there's another place to find it, which is, uh, or another place to find these stories, which is uh, near-death.com, near-death.com, but it's near and then hyphen death.com. You go on there, you click on stories. There are, I think, hundreds of stories on there that were curated. And when I, when I, one thing I love about the stories is that they're usually from people who aren't famous. Um, you know, they're just everyday people. They're not trying to be famous either. They're just telling a story, you know, and usually people think they're crazy. So there, there's no benefit of them telling the story other than telling their truth. That's one thing I love about it. It's, it's kind of this guileless, you know, honest story sharing of what happened to them. And secondly, the stories are usually very inspirational, giving us a perspective, a larger perspective about life or helping us to remember what the purpose of life might be. And, and so I love reading that stuff. It just, it, it's all, I've never had a near death experience myself, but I feel like reading by this point, I've read hundreds of those stories. It almost has given me the benefits of, of that without having to almost die. <laughs> so. Wow. That's powerful to connect on that level, you know? Yeah. So I'd like to talk a bit about your new book, Joyful Productivity. And I've read it already. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. And so let, will you share with everybody a little bit about 
you, the vision for it, when you came up with the idea, kind of like this backstory behind this book, because most people that I run into, when I say, you know, check out the book, Joyful Productivity, they go, those two words don't go together. <laughs> you know, when I'm productive, I'm not joyful. When I'm joyful, I'm certainly not being productive. Right. And, and so it's, it's a great title. So mm -hmm. um, I think we'd be interested in some of the backstory. Yeah. So I have always been interested since fairly young age about time management. You know, how do we make the best use of our life? I've been interested in life purpose and, and being organized and time management. So, and I, you know, years ago, I, I, I read the book, Getting Things Done by David Allen, one of the famous books in, in, in this field. And I loved the book and I, I practiced it religiously for years. Um, and I've also, of course, read, you know, Stephen Covey, uh, you know, Getting Things Done and, and the other kind of big uh, productivity methodologies. So I used to be a fairly conventional productivity guy. I used to say, yeah, you got to just, you know, schedule your calendar and, and you know, you got to just very, you know, to keep a to-do list and clear your emails and, you know, fairly conventional things, which are, by the way, good ideas to do that, right? Because it helps you to be, helps you to feel more calm about, okay, this is what I know I need to do. Over the years, as I've kind of deepened my own spiritual practice, I wanted to bring that, that spirituality into my productivity teachings. And not just teaching, but also in how I do my own productivity. That's kind of how Jewel for Productivity was born. I said, you know, what if instead of just getting things done, instead of just becoming more efficient, right, or, or becoming more effective at your skills, what if we can infuse purpose and heart and spiritual growth into these ideas what if instead of being becoming more efficient and effective we are practicing you know or you could say mindfulness in our in our work you know instead of getting things done what if we saw the bigger picture of as i'm doing this work it is connected to my deep my deeper values and, and of, for example, for me, the deeper values of service, it's not just getting this project done, you know, faster and, and more perfectly, right? So, and, and also, how do we approach difficult tasks and challenging projects that we tend to avoid? Can we see that as a spiritual practice? And so, as I started trying out different things and different ways of thinking about it, I found that I found a way of doing my work that wasn't only efficient, but it was deeply joyful because the joy doesn't come from just the completion of the task. You know, it doesn't come just from, oh, look, it was successful externally. But the joy, I think, to find true joyful productivity, it needs to be in the moment. It needs to happen before you see what the results are. And so that's the practice I've been working on for a couple of years now. I mean, I think Joe for Predicary really started probably back in like 2013, 2014. So, you know, about four years now I've been practicing this. So I decided to kind of write about this practice. I'm grateful to say that now that I've been practicing it for a couple of years, you know, I do find deep joy in just about every act of work that I do. And so it's even more fun now. You know, my, my business is even more enjoyable now because I found this deeper, or you could say deeper layer or this higher purpose for every action, which brings us that deeper spirit of, you might say calm Zen or that deep joy. Wow, that's great. I, I just love that. And I like the whole having joy along the way. And so many yeah. people get caught up in the outcome that right. they just, they just miss the beauty of the journey, you know, and mm -hmm. the whole time. I know I've done it before in my life and over the years I've gotten more and more into the moment. So but I remember those days when everything was about the outcome and that, there was no joy until the end. And then it was short lived. Yeah, that's right. You know? And yeah. that now I have a lot more joy mm. and um. And I have another question that it might put you on the spot a little, but probably not because 
I'm remembering a term you used. I think it was in a video I saw once. I don't know. But you talked about creative rest. I really believe that, that um, this audience could really benefit from a little bit of what that is. I, I'm not remembering it 100%, but I remember hearing the term and going, creative rest. You know, gifted, visionary type people are creative. And sometimes they don't allow themselves to rest. And mm. so when I heard those words together from you, I thought that maybe you could elaborate on that a little of what that entails, what it's about, you know, how to kind of wrap the, the idea into our awareness. Yeah, absolutely. So that actually is a chapter in the book. So maybe that's, that's how, that's what you're remembering as you Oh, remember. there you go. <laughs> yeah. So the idea, um, I call it frequent creative rest there you go I remember and, that. and the, I, the idea of it is that you're partnering with your your amazing brain which has two modes of 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 working one mode is when you are doing your work focused conscious you are you know you're you're, you're focused how people usually think of as you're working right now okay that's mm -hmm. the focused mode and then the other mode of your brain, which a lot of us didn't know about, you know, it, that is still creative and it's still working. It's called diffused mode. Diffused mode is when you get up from your work and you go for a walk or you make tea or you take a nap or you, you know, do a crossword puzzle, whatever. As long as it's not the same task, you know, and it's somewhat relaxing for you your brain is still working on the task that you worked on earlier. Your subconscious mind is still hard at work in the diffused mode. And so if you do that, you'll find that if you take frequent creative rest, I call it creative rest because it's even though you're resting, even if you're sleeping or napping or taking a shower or going for a walk or playing with a, you know, playing a game, a video game, or hanging out with a friend or having a meal, you're still being creative. Your brain is being creative, working on, this, on the problem that you have worked on earlier that day. You'll find that when you do come back to the focused mode later, you have ideas that you didn't have before. Where, and sometimes those ideas are brilliant. You're like, how come I never thought of them? How come I didn't think of this when I was working earlier? You know, when I was so intense, right? Like, like with furrowed eyebrows and like, like, you know, just with scrunched up shoulders trying to figure out this problem or whatever. It's because you need the diffused, your, your, in fact, your diffused mode is far more creative than your focused mode. Oh, so now, that's why the inspired ideas pop in later. Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? And then some people say, hey, I get some of the brilliant, most brilliant ideas in the shower, right, for example. Or like some people wake up in the middle of the night and have these inspired ideas, right? Well, it's diffused mode at work or, or going for a walk, right? On, on your walk, you're like, oh my, or when you travel, you know, traveling is also one of those diffused mode uh, times. That's why it's not the smartest thing to do to focus for too long at once. You, you have a problem to solve. You have a project to complete. Fine. But don't just sit there in front of the computer for three hours at a time if you want to be truly smart. If you want to be smart, maybe you sit there and focus for, I don't know, whatever the time frame is, 15 minutes, 25 minutes. 25 minutes is very popular these days with a method called the Pomodoro method. Uh, the Pomodoro method is this time management method of working in 25-minute chunks. You work for 25 minutes, and then you take a break for five minutes. 25 minutes again, take a break for five minutes. And you do several of these until you, maybe after three or four cycles, you, you can decide that. You can take a longer break instead of five minute break. You take a longer break. So that really uses this idea of frequent creative rest as well. Whether it's going for a walk or playing with your you know, dog or you know, having a meal or doing the dishes or, yeah, it could be chores too. You know, it could be things that are useful, puttering around that you're, you're doing diffused mode so-called work on whatever thing you were working on. So, so what I do, my favorite way of doing is taking naps. This may, seem, this may sound strange to, to everyone listening, but I take four naps a day. Four? <laughs> four. I, I actually do four, sometimes even five. So uh, I take a nap after, well, at, usually after I eat, I get sleepy <laughs> or get, I, my, my brain has a fog. And so I take a nap after breakfast, lunch, uh, after breakfast, 
uh, lunch and also in the mid morning and in the mid afternoon. So four, four naps a day. And my naps are usually anywhere between 10 and 10 and 30 minutes. Um, and I sometimes fall asleep, sometimes I don't, but even just laying down and relaxing is very helpful. And I think it's great for diffuse mode. And I come back refreshed and I usually have new ideas or a new perspective, a new energy to work again. And so the frequent naps allow you to have that renewed energy. And so your productivity remains high. So yes, it, yes. And actually more effective and joyful and happy, which sounds counterintuitive to some people who are, you know, the work, work, work. And, you know, I say a lot to people that I work with, you're not a machine. <laughs> You know, like we're not a machine and we're beings, not doings. It's so it's important to listen to our own rhythm and and be in that space and, and pay attention to it and, and be real with ourselves. So that's great. Four naps a day. I love that. Now, that's that's <laughs> probably more than most people should do. <laughs> right. But, uh, but even if you. Yeah. In other words, give yourself that permission to to rest, to uh, take a nap if need be, or go for a walk, or play a video game, or what anything, as long as it's not too addictive, you know, that's that's the danger of certain actions. But do something that's not quite addictive, but it's it's you know it's it's a it's a break. Give yourself that permission, knowing that you'll be more creative as a result. Awesome, that is great. So we're coming near to the end of our time together, and I could keep going forever talking mm -hmm. to you about these amazing topics. And I would like you to share a little bit about like how people can reach you. Of course, I'm going to have your website in the show notes, but if there's anything that you would like to share with, with this audience that, you know, is on your heart or on your mind and, and a little bit about, you know, your mission and what you're doing and those different kinds of things. Thank you. So you can just Google me, really, George Cow, K-A-O. Thankfully, I, I'm the first one who comes up. Uh, if you found our discussion of productivity inspiring, those listening, you you might want to buy the book Joyful Productivity. It's only five dollars US for for the Kindle version, and uh, soon there's going to be a paperback version and an audiobook version down the line as well. Uh, if you prefer to kind of have me facilitate these concepts in an online course, a video course. Uh, that's available too, uh, $45, uh, Joy for Productivity. You could just Google Joy for Productivity Workshop, George Cow, and they should come up right there. Wonderful. That would be great. In fact, I will Google it and put that actual URL in the show notes for everybody so you can find it very rapidly if you're interested in it because it, it is a very um, – the, when I read the book, it was very refreshing to me to mm. read ideas and things that aligned a lot with the way I see things but also that were – happy you know like i was reading about productivity and there was no part of me that felt oh no or heavy or how long mm. is this book or where's the end of the chapter or any of that it was <laughs> it was engaging in that way and yeah. conversational and so it kept my interest i mean i sat down in one reading and read it pretty much in one sitting and i don't typically do that mm. uh, i typically move around a lot but i was like I love this. Let's do the next chapter. You know, let's do the next chapter. It was great. So thank you for putting that work out and, you know, and really offering ideas about being an entrepreneur and productivity and just life and how to do it in a way that is authentic and it's real and it's generous and, and service related, which mm. is, you know, is so important. And, and it's such a great example, which is why you're in my book, <laughs> oh. The Visionary Leaders, because that I believe is a visionary, that authenticity and that service that's real and genuine and uh, does not have an ulterior undisclosed motive. And so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Diane. I'm so grateful for you doing this podcast for um, your audience who, well, feels like you really get them, you know, <laughs> thank you for doing, thank you for this ministry of service. And I, I, I'm just really looking forward to sharing this with, with more people. Oh, it will be fun. So thank you for being on the show and everybody listening. Remember this, keep your face to the sun because the shadows fall behind you and whatever you do, remember you're here on purpose with a purpose. So let's get going. Are you tired of searching for someone who understands you? Join our Facebook group, Someone Gets Me. In this group, you will be able to connect with others who are intense, sensitive, smart, talented, and wanting to be understood. Diane shares her insights and teachings, and you can connect with others. Join today.